Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we bring you another special, a conversation between Vladimir Milov, Russian economist, currently obviously in exile, and uh, Michael Naki, a rather well-known Russian media sphere blogger. They discuss the limits of Russian military production, military industrial complex, an emergent prohibition on the export of gasoline that appeared in Russia, and the inflation that is devouring everything in the Putin's realm. This stream is always using quite a lot of charts and graphs, and it is uh, time-consuming work to redo them in a nice uh, format. So what we'll do uh, in this case, we'll do quick Google Translate screen grabs and post them under this video. Special thanks go to our members, of course. Today it is uh, Ludmila Skaryantova and Onur Bekos. Thank you. Without your help, guys, it would be quite a bit more difficult to continue producing these videos. And with this, let's take a listen. Enjoy. Hello, Vladimir. So, some time has passed since our previous stream, and uh, we have had a chance to listen to Vladimir Putin's message internally, where he promised, I don't know, trillions of dollars and rubles to every citizen of Russia. Not sure where he's going to take them from. Um, and there's a lot of stats that are not really showing any convincing growth of Russian economy or any good perspective. So, perhaps you can share what did you pay attention to during the last week. All right. Hello, everybody. Let's start with the basic thing that I lost my bet with Michael. We were betting on the exchange rate of ruble to dollar. And after having won the first one, that dollar became more expensive than 100 rubles. We argued that by the 1st of March, it will be over 200 and it didn't happen. So our $100 bet goes back to Michael. But it's not done yet, and I think we'll continue this conversation after the 17th of March, because we can definitely see they're holding the exchange rate to the day of so-called elections. It uh, is trying to storm the 100 rubles again, and it's slightly lower, it's in the 90s now, but general re-fortification of ruble didn't happen, and on the backdrop of almost 100% sale of their uh, profits of uh, the currencies by the exporters, um, that creates additional pressure. So I'm sure we'll be back at 100 and even further. This week was rather busy with different statistic parameters and reports, and it's interesting to counterimpose that on what Putin was uh, saying. And everything becomes more voluminous once you start comparing the real numbers. So let's start with inflation. This is not going down. It has been two weeks since the statement by Nabiulina, the head of a central bank in Russia, where she said that she sees some obscure deflationary processes with her whatever sensors, but nothing the F is happening and of that kind. And uh, inflation has exceeding has been uh, growing and accelerating since the 26th of January, and now it's at 7.6 percent, and it's not returning back to any controlled corridor by a central bank. We did uh, create our running chart of uh, the best price growth, the most, the most inflationary price growth on uh, some of the goods. And we want to say cucumbers went down a bit in price, as people are saying, and the, as the experts call it, that's the limit of consumption. Um, and still they're at 29% of price growth since the beginning of the year. Cabbage is now growing, almost at the same growth. So these uh, interesting titles in the official newspaper in Russia, I bought some cabbage and now my pockets are empty. So they're acknowledging that these things are happening. And it's not just one type of goods, eggs, cucumbers, cabbage, chicken. We can see that everything that is dependent on some imported components, it does have downstream effects on the price. Very interesting moment last week after vegetables, some other elements of the consumer basket started to grow. Meat, butter, salt. I did not add all of the medical items, but uh, there is significant growth of 4 to 5% for different uh, kinds of medicine since the beginning of the year. And it's a growing, growing assortment. Another thing of notice, 7.5% growth for airfare tickets, the economy class, and that's according to Russian stat, 
That means in real world it's higher than that. That was predictable, and I remember we discussed with you that airfare are moving to the segment that are less accessible for a middle-class citizen and becomes a sort of a premium feature. And uh, one cannot afford really to fly the plane on the usual salary in Russia. I'm getting a lot of feedback that you guys are all discussing the Russian stat inflation data, and this is pointless because real inflation is higher. Exact, exactly so. Yeah, we, Alexander, are discussing the minimum inflation, and this is the picture looking at the minimum possible inflation that is in reality, of course, it is higher. And in other nomenclatures, in other industries, it uh, exceeds official inflation two or th even three times. So, yeah, that's all correct. We acknowledge the lowest bracket of the inflation that is already acknowledged and reaffirmed by the leadership in Russia. And these are the numbers that they use in order to change the refinance rate. And that's what I'm saying, that Nabiulina, when she says that there is some lowering of the inflationary pressure, no, even on the lower bracket, it keeps growing. And it starts to grow on the wider group of goods, not just select few. And it's not anomaly with some fruits and vegetables at the beginning of the year. It uh, does manifest to other key consumer goods. And I wanted to give here a chart. I keep going back to Romir. This is a sociological research group that is uh, mostly doing research in the consumer goods market. Romir.ru, you can check it for yourself. And they have a special index, FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods, so daily consumption, uh, not, not just uh, food items, but everything you see in a usual supermarket. And you can see that a growth since the beginning of invasion over two years, you can see that the growth for many of them is over... 50%. But if you take three years, some prices grew up almost 300%. So basically doubled in uh, the time of the two and something years. So when people are saying that the inflation is lower, and uh, when you argue us, um, inflation the numbers we're discussing is lower than real inflation, the actual numbers are definitely higher. Sure. Um, by the way, they are closing a lot of data since the beginning of invasion. If before we had a ton of stats that we could analyze the real inflation, now everything is uh, basically effing closed and we only have two or three indicators to rely upon. But even they uh, do not show any rainbows and unicorns that they're trying to convince everybody in. And another interesting moment here, we're trying to show you different segments of market, different sources as well. So we're not just picking one number and going with it. We also include uh, different polls on the observed inflation that the businesses and consumers acknowledge. and. Comparing and bringing all the data together, I think one can see pretty clear picture that inflation becomes the main and very stable economic problem in Putin's Russia. It is not going anywhere. And attempt to order it to stop, a military style, stop. One, two, no, it doesn't. It doesn't go anywhere. It's been over two years of these attempts and they're failing. We can discuss Putin's message, but and probably there are some interesting notes there that um, were remained outside of the main, mostly discussed items. He said, for example, that in current GDP growth, 90% is high technology sectors of economy. He tried to boast with that number. But we know that besides military production, Russia doesn't really have high tech sectors. The rest of the economy is rather primitive. So. This is basically the acknowledgement that 90% of that GDP growth that we're talking about, and we've showed that before in the previous stream, right, on the Rostat numbers, he said, and acknowledged himself, that 90% of that GDP growth is just blatantly war product. He wanted to boast with that, that's what they gave him the picture on the paper, right, with pretty words how to describe that. Central Bank was formulating the industries that are not satisfying consumer demand. That is what's called military production. Uh, we understand what it is, and he basically acknowledged that all these numbers of growth that he is boasting is military. Yeah, it is high tech, sure, but it doesn't do any damn good for consumers. And everything that is being produced is being destroyed on the battlefield. And also with attacks on the, some of the military production objects by uh, Ukraine. 
and it doesn't multiply anything in GDP. So you produced an artillery shell and then you need to await for more money from the budget to produce another shell to blow it up. This is not an economic chain. There is no economic multiplier in that. That's why it is known in the economy that high military GDP doesn't really lead to the economic growth overall. And he still lives in some parallel reality that has no relation to what is happening in the real world. Two things, again, uh, of note. He again says about fifth place in the world. And he is saying that Russia overtook Germany. Again, I don't know what to suggest. Just go to one um, district, one region in Germany, to Westphalia. And the economy of that region is bigger than the whole Russian economy. And the second one is that on the parity of the consumer purchasing power, if you're getting a dollar a month in, let's say, Rwanda, and you can buy some food and eat them and not die of hunger, it doesn't mean that your level of life in Rwanda is high and the, that Rwandan economy is high and, profit and uh, flourishing. That's the same thing in Russia. Uh, that's why the situation is really going down. It's not growing. It's not uh, blooming. And the same thing with the poverty in Russia. Inflation is growing, but the poverty bracket is not being re-indexed. So by Rostat, 14,500 rubles a month, that's your cutoff for the poverty level. So if you're getting 15,000 rubles a month, which is roughly about $150, that means you're not poor anymore. And right, $170 a month, according to Putin, is middle class, right? Yeah, people need to make more data in the media sphere. Everybody understands that he is lying, but for many people, these official statements um, really show the light when you show them in comparison with the real numbers. And when he says that we are less poor now in Russia, right? But then you basically compare the actual numbers and it doesn't show it. Oh yeah, they change the tactics, how they calculate numbers. Very simple trick, indeed, Michael. They're just not in a rush to re-index the poverty levels according to inflation. Inflation is growing, salaries have to try to catch up with that, but they left the poverty level at the previous level. And all of a sudden they have fewer poor people. Statistically, it's such a fool's joke that uh, it doesn't even take much explaining to for people to get the light bulb and to understand that over their head. So. He is still, though, promising some trillion dollars. And yeah, exactly. That's what the main message. We will give more money to regions. We'll forgive all the loans and money they owe to the center. I don't know where he gets the money, right? Exactly. What is another tricky thing here? Every time when he is promising that, he is saying till 2030. So this is considered to be the end of his next presidential term. He is not saying we'll give you a trillion rubles tomorrow, right? And if you remember how our Ministry of Finance is funding the budgetary expenses, they're holding the money for the whole year and only giving it back at the last month of the fiscal year. So if Putin is saying, we'll spend this much till 2030, that means that at least till 2029, nobody will see that if they even not forget until then. Because the time is running so fast that, again, either a donkey dies or a shah dies until that happens. And I think you're giving him an advance here. You're actually supposing that he will even find that money to give. But we know, according to other statements, like well-known May declarations and some other fuckery that he presented to his elector, electors, that um, he is looking for, you're presenting that he is looking for some sch schemes to find the money. No, he's not. Most likely he's just promising. And the promising doesn't mean that he will marry, right? As in the proverb. Um, exactly, yeah, he's just packaging it in the fashion that he leaves a ton of room for maneuver for himself. And whether he will give that money today or six years from now, we'll see, remains to be seen, right? And you said it correctly that all of his promises need to be analyzed in the light of experience of previous years. And there are two interesting moments here. First, same thing happened in 2012 with the first version of May orders, and then the same thing in 2018. So we do have a long history. He is not at the wheel for the first year. We have a long history of him fucking up his own election electors and his own populace. He promises a ton and then does nothing. 
than some external circumstances. And yeah, then he comes out and says, with the known circumstances, we need to tighten our belts. And all these promises and all that pile that he dropped on uh, his uh, people listening to him, one should look at that in the experience of the 2012 and 2018 that has been reviewed and cancelled a billion times after. And a second aspect of that, we'll come back to some bright cases like uh, airfare, but all that is built on one model, that there is a government that is the only main actor, is both mom and dad, it's some hermaphrodite kind, and it's giving money to everybody, money to some, subsidies to others, loans to somebody else, and only because of this uh, governmentally parental figure, anything can grow. I think time and time again we keep seeing that it doesn't grow based on the government. Look at this civilian aircraft construction. They've propped up such uh, drummed up corporations. They've dumped a billion dollars into that, billions, and uh, nothing works. They can't make a proper engine. They can't make proper composite materials. So it's already a known, a dead, not working model or the main recipient of money that he is saying. Yeah, they will actually dedicate some money for different programs, but the main beneficiaries of that would be guys like Chemezov, some of his oligarchs who will buy another apartment, another real estate for 20 billion, but there'll be no jets, there'll be no engines. We've listened to that same story over and over again. I don't even see people who are really believing that. Maybe. Uh, that uh, actress Nastia Vleva, who is now believing that. No, I don't think so. I don't think she believes much. She is responding to a certain punishment, societal punishment, uh, as her excuse for the nude party. And um, it's not, I think, that she is a convert. And Sobchak also recently wrote another post. Yay, what an amazing post. And you guys can go dig it up in her social media. And she did thumbs up and saying, yay, that's fantastic. That's uh, their atonement for the naked party that was so heavily criticized a few months ago that they actually are celebrating things and enjoying life when uh, Russia is at uh, war for its uh, survival against the whole world and NATO. And I would say citizens of Russia do not really believe that. They've seen enough of that shit for 20 years and they're just quietly giggling off the record. And uh, Western media didn't really pay much attention to Putin's speech too. They only cut out a little piece about the nukes that was there. But even people who were in the meeting with him, they were not believing him too. Some people were asleep, others were dropping their phones and doing something there. And neophytes like Slatkov, like the, some of those military correspondents on the Russian side invited to that meeting, they were asking questions and taking pictures. They're like, how can you sleep when president is declaring such an important thing for the next six years? When people just know this is uh, just lies. Not, there's, there'll be no, not even an attempt to realize that in real world. And I think if we actually take it all together and calculate and imagine that Vladimir Putin and the rest will do their best to get out of their pants and find a way to get the money or sell something, whatever. There's no way to even find the, these funds, right? Um, yeah, absolutely true, Michael. We'll see the numbers on the February budget coming soon. And as we discussed, they created a castle in the sand for the budget of 24, but they are not seeing that growth of income. Absolutely true. And these fellows at the meeting, they absolutely are aware of all these uh, exact numbers. They know numbers that are not released to the public and they know how much it doesn't work. It's such a huge uh, Potemkin village of gigantic historic proportions. And none of it is actually meeting with matching reality. And he's only trying to create another hyper version of the same promise that some bureaucrats will come, pick some projects, will give some money where needed, and our fantastic economy will grow on the shoulders of these bureaucrats. And that keep go keeps going on for how many years already? People are not trusting it anymore. Um, Reshetnikov, the Minister of Economy, was uh, making a statement in the Arab Emirates commenting Putin's message. and. When he was asked about the economic results, and just don't fall off your chair, he said, by 2030, we'll get to the level of GDP growth of 3%. The fuck? Is he serious? And that's the minister, Putin's minister of economy? 
So before we had a goal of catching up and taking over Portugal on the level of life and the GDP, and now we're getting to, what, 3%? Seriously? By 2030? I uh, can't read it without tears and laughter. And you know, I was hearing that for decades. I remember my parents still telling about Khrushchev, how he was building communism till 1970, till 1980, then Gorbachev promised something to 2000s, and now that's 2030 is like that uh, carrot ahead of us in Alice in Wonderland. That's like a jam for tomorrow. Right, can we eat it today? No, because it's for tomorrow. So 3% by 2030, it's basically acknowledgement that nothing is working. It's capitulation and acknowledgement of their own defeat. Because the main driver of the normal economy should be private investors. Russia is closed for private investors, just forget about that. So this is not going to happen while Putin is alive, while the war is raging. And he, on somewhere in the background, he understands that. And he still wants to send a signal to private business. And he is saying in his message that we should, and just blatantly lying here, we should provide the guarantees of security to private investors. While he is nationalizing Chelyabinsk electric metallurgy factory. And that's happening at the same time. And that thousands of zombies that are listening in this, uh, his captive audience in that hall, listening to him, they, they know all that. And that's why they're sleeping, because it doesn't matter. What is worth of all these words when he is lying online, live on cameras, when he will not be touching upon, touching any property of private investors while taking away big assets from one of the big investors? So, anything else you might have noticed in this message, or do we want to proceed with the next question? Look, I wanted, Michael, to draw a bridge here, that in general, while he is saying all that, there was a publication in Commerçant with a referral to the Institute of Agriculture and uh, Industry Prognostication of the Academy of Sciences. And it says that they have reviewed the prognosis of GDP growth for this year in just a couple months, from 1.6 to 1.2. So in about over a month, they diminished the prognostication of GDP by four points. And Putin was boasting that his military production is a driver of their development, but it ceases to be an effective driver. And even the economists of the from the Prognostication Institute, they are saying that Russia has reached the limit of uh, military production at their current capacity, at their current factories and uh, manufacturing capacities. We talked about that briefly before, right? That's what you were promising, that it seems, um, Vladimir, that it actually was true. Right, so we have three kinds of production that are growing, right? We have electronics and optical, goods, we have metallic uh, goods, arms and uh, shells, and other transport means, meaning planes, tanks and APCs. And it shows that they can keep the high level of growth of uh, production only in the top one, and that's where the drones are. All the hardware, all the shells and artillery and tanks, they're plateauing. We're not seeing any huge growth potential like last year when they had hit 30 percent some of them on these charts as you can see the equipment the arms the tempo has really been going down since roughly the middle of last year they reached some peak of uh, production mid 23 and now it's plateauing out and even going down because in order to continue producing you need new production lines you need new machines and russia is not manufacturing these machines moreover Many of them are not produced even in China. So they had to find roundabout ways to bring in some Taiwanese equipment. And there was a story that they were buying some equipment from Germany through Turkey. And that's what I keep sending a message to my colleagues in the West. Forget everything. Start working and stifling Putin's effort to get access to this high-tech machinery. If they fail to keep that access, to keep maintenance, and spare parts uh, arriving to Russia, you'll be super effective. Just make sure there is no service of existing pieces of equipment, and they're all Western, they're all Western made. So it's really Western equipment that is producing all these arms that are used by Putin's army on the front. So this is that 
kryptonite. It's a very, it's his Achilles heel. If you manage to stifle the channel for supplies of these equipment and these pieces of machinery, this will effectively kill Russian military production capability much more effective than drones and many other things. Putin was boasting with that military complex, and at the same time, this is the one that is slowing its growth significantly. It's actually plateauing, and one can see that it is his general weakness now. So if we're talking about sanctions, this is a top priority to, I would say, to block the channels of uh, grey imports of machinery, industrial machinery and supplies thereof. So all the military industrial complex slow down except for optical and uh, electronic products. Is it because it's uh, different somehow? Well, it's not too complicated product of a production, that's why. Well, I would think that electronics is uh, more complex than machinery for metal goods and transport. Well, yes and no. The electronics is much easier to bring over because simple and massive components are much easier to be brought into Russia. You can put chips in a suitcase and bring them in. But in order to bring a heavy piece of machinery, uh, something unique that was designed and made, manufactured in Germany, you know, the, for example, a machine that makes um, guns, it's a very traceable piece of machinery. You can basically track it from satellite if you want to. So this is a whole different story that Russia indeed has issues with their own electronics, but it's much easier to import it than heavy machinery equipment that will be used for pressing metal, for manufacturing tanks, APCs, artillery systems and others. So if we add more efforts in trying to block these channels from existence, so all that whining that Putin is winning, this doesn't show that he is. This data shows that he is barely holding by the skin of his teeth, effectively. So he's limited not only in money, but he is also limited in manufacturing capabilities, which is also acknowledged by the Institute of the Academy of Sciences. They're writing about that. So that's what I would want to send this message to the West with. My deep conviction is that Putin is playing a very large-scale bluff that everything that is being done now, this is uh, elements of one big bluff, both from the front line, where they drop all the efforts they can in order to show that um, they can achieve some result per second, per uh, unit of time, and they're wasting their resources in colossal proportions because they will be hurting from that for years to come. But they want to show something right now, and they're trying to show the same thing with economy that is supposedly being pumped up from some reserves, but the reserves are not endless. They're already almost depleted. The growth of economy is negative, and there is a very fucking real growth of inflation. So this is, in my view, uh, is a significant uh, push. Uh, it's a bluff on his behalf, which unfortunately a lot of people still believe in. And what we're trying to do here is try to take uh, these ephemeric clothes of that naked king he is naked, his economy is barely existing. His economy is not coping with it well. There is nothing behind these statements. We can see in reality they are literally very close to very negative parameters. So, in this statement, I think it was self-revealing, where he said that, well, of course, we understand how the West caused uh, Soviet Union to fall apart. It was dragged into the arms race where Soviet Union expanded all of its resources and fell apart. And here, one with brain would stop, stand up and say, so you understand what you're doing now, right, Vlad? But he continues here and he's saying that unlike Soviet Union, we're not spending everything for military development and arms. We have a normal industrial uh, growth within the civilian sector and consumer goods sector. So how would you judge that statement? Well. This, Michael, sounded absolutely dumb when a person grew his military expenses to the maximum since the Soviet times. Even in the recent uh, 30 years, we have never breached that level. And now he is growing these expenses to 6% GDP with a perspective for more. So we are going in that direction. So he is saying that 90% of industrial growth is essentially military industry. Let's call, call it what it is. And yet he is saying that we will not allow them to drag us into the arms race. This is a schizophrenic statement. 
And there are a lot of contradictions like that in his speech. And uh, one can bring up old uh, Grandpa Freud because Putin somewhere understands himself that this model doesn't have perspectives and it's finite. And that's why what you said, he is trying to bluff to the maximum, to win as much as he can with his bluff, to demoralize the opponents, to do some sort of psychic attack that I'm winning, I'm on the horse. And I wrote recently a big paper for uh, one center in Brussels about these sanctions and uh, the targets that should be hit. I will be using that document. I'll go to Bucharest. We have more meetings with European parties and then in Strasbourg. I'm visiting a lot of conferences where I'm going to tell all these uh, data and data points to those people who are involved in developing of these solutions. I'll write a couple articles somewhere, probably in Atlantic Council or somewhere, where we can discuss that. We will be breaking it. I think it is a very poor job done by the category of whiners on the West who earlier than they should, earlier than it is time, they're jumping to write articles that everything is horrible. Everything is concerning, right, but still, Putin has a very fundamental weakness and it is the right time to identify them and to keep hitting them, to keep targetedly hitting them. Because, right, uh, why, because of um, whining, you motivate oneself, you demotivate yourself to do the actual things needed and then everything becomes even worse, right. So, I agree, whining is um, not productive. So, let's go back to Russian stat on some other directions, maybe besides uh, military production, there is any light at the end of tunnel for Russian economy? No, there is no light in this tunnel. And Rostat published one new volume uh, for 2024, first data on the January. And um, we can look at the traditional data points for the real sector. Industry is slightly better than in December. And again, the main driver here is military production, 4.6% growth. All the other elements of real sector of economy is negative. Agriculture is minus 0.2. And that uh, is also reflected in the prices of uh, veggies. Cargo transport is going down. The cargo volume transported by railroad declined by almost 10% in January. So we'll see what happened there, but this is very closed information. We can see some data there that transport uh, went down by almost 2%. And railroad cargo issues, they're usually a preceding indicator to a lot of other things downstream. That's why a lot of projects about slowing down of economy starting to surface is because they are probably reflecting the common processes here. And it seems to me that business needs to start to sober up that these schemes through China or Kazakhstan will save Russia somehow, because it is very expensive. And at best, the margin is near zero. That's my theory here, and we'll check on it later, that it is not profitable and people are just closing shops and stop bringing goods by these channels. It's curious. We'll see. It remains to be checked. It's a hypothesis for now. And another right number that I pulled from the collection by Rostat, in January of 24, the growth of real pensions was 0.1%. Right, but it's still growth, indeed. Yeah, I mean, you can say that they grew. But when you're going to talk about Putin, Sobchak, Avleva, and all these wonderful promises and appreciations of how fantastic everything goes, will index everything up, all that indexation is being devoured by inflation into zero. Actually, not, not fully, right? They have 0.1. Well, right, there is a 10% of one left, 0.1. So, if one looks at the table of the Russian economy, there are no signs of it getting more alive. There is a slowdown on a lot of major indexes. They plan to index their pensions by 7.5% and 9.8% for the salaries of the budgetary workers, but uh, the federal workers. But these are negligent numbers. They're small. They will be eaten and devoured by inflation fully. So, all his remarks that everybody will get wealthier, they're about nothing. Also, remember about the gasoline. That was another interesting prohibition this week that surfaced up. So, 
Unfortunately, Russian stat gives data with about a month delay about the sales and processes in the gasoline market. So on the 26th of February, they made a publication about January and the decline of production of gasoline in January was almost 6%. This is serious. And this is related to all these breakages and drone attacks on the refineries. And first of all, it's Luke Oil, uh, Nizhny Novgorod and Volgograd. That's where the decline is coming from. And what do I hear from my sources in uh, Russian government is that indeed they slapped that rather hysteric prohibition for gasoline exports since the 1st of March. And they're saying, yeah, we're doing that every year, right? So what did they decide? The government was panicking a bit and wanted to slap the prohibition immediately. But in January, oil companies said, let's wait a little. Let's see, maybe Luke Oil will find a way to replenish that equipment and maybe we will be able to avoid these strict measures. So one can conclude they failed to find that equipment. If they are still bringing that prohibition up in March, the, it, it's a very bad measure for the oil industry. The oil industry is absolutely against it. They're making money on it, right? Exactly. So this is like the measure of last hope, essentially, for them, for the government. So if government is doing that, that means that situation was searching equipment to replace whatever was damaged by the drones. It seems the outlook of that was pretty bad. And they have to take some commissar-style measures and slap prohibitions on the economy. But they're trying to say, to portray it as it, if it is a seasonal story. Vladimir, is it true? Do they do it annually or it doesn't happen? That every spring they prohibit sales of gasoline. No, they never slept a full, they never used full prohibition. They've done some elements of prohibition in autumn. There was a big price crisis on the gasoline market, remember? And oil companies basically went for profits and the government decided to exert some pressure on them. This is a very rare measure. It's definitely an extreme measure, like a full prohibition of exports. And if you want, I can find you a lot of quotes by different bureaucrats, even relatively recent years, where they're saying that, no, this hurts investment climate, we can never do that. Obviously, they'll be saying different things now, after the decision is made, but the measure is an extreme one. Very non-profitable for oil companies, they're seriously against it and they have rather large influence. And if that is being used against them, that means situation is dire. 6% of uh, decline in the gasoline production, this is serious. And if we're talking about high octane gasoline, this is even higher than that. This is where you'll probably see the fall of 15%, because that Look, oil cracking doesn't create uh, basic gasoline. The one that was hit, that was uh, the one producing high-octane gasoline. So it is only supported by the numbers that, yeah, our f Ukrainian friends were very, very effective. And these pieces of machinery, they're very easy to see from afar. They're unique. You can see them. They're easy targets. So in general, we can see that these tactics by Ukraine, they start. it starts to show some result. And now the West is not supplying any spare parts and full replacement because of the sanctions. So gasoline sphere actually became also rather vulnerable. What else can I say here about nationalization of Chelyabinsk metallurgic factory? This is the group. It was, I think it was called Etalon, the Ural Siberian group founded by Chelyabinsk businessmen, Antipa and Arestov back in the 90s. This is Chelyabinsk electric metallurgic factory, and then they bought Kuznetsk and one more, factories of uh, ferrous materials. So all this ferrochrome, ferrosilicate, and they're used to produce high quality steel, which is used effectively and very heavily in military production. And that was a private holding, it was a private group. They were actually part of 200 largest Russian companies on uh, the turnover and the profits. And this is a big business. So what they're doing now, uh, Rolf was taken away from Sergei Petrov. Uh, there was Kiwi Bank liquidated. The bank wasn't fully taken away, but the payment market was taken away from him. Now they're taking Chelyabinsk factory. So they're starting blanket um, expropriation of property from all businessmen that are not related to Putin's inner circles. And they're using different context. 
with Rolf, they said that uh, the proprietor is registered in uh, the an, uh, animus country. With Kiwi Bank, they were prosecuting some terrorist funding. With Chelyabinsk Metallurgic Factory, the dusting off some questions about privatization. Of course, privatization in the 90s was had, had issues, but uh, they're using it as an excuse. Vladimir, that's a new page for me. So first of all, it makes me smile because I remember those people who are not fully satisfied with Putin, but uh, they are making money and they are running business in Russia. They were often saying that we are afraid of the opposition or supporting the opposition because they may come and cancel the results of privatization and we'll have to give up our property. And there was a big discussion about that. Well, here it is for you. Now Putin is taking away your properties and if he can do that with Chelyabinsk, why can he not do that with everything else? Why cannot he use the same precedent to nationalize most of everything? And it seems like the government does have that intention. So. Being uh, even a loyal businessman to Putin's regime, I would be very accurate now and would start considering what can I do to not get into that situation. Oh yeah, they're all fretting. They're all scared uh, right now. You can see and they acknowledge that, different businessmen. And they acknowledge that this is a systemic process. Before they had Khodorkovsky, right, they, they only as the only example. And they could say that Khodorkovsky wasn't paying taxes, right, as an excuse. Nobody else did pay them well, but still. And now it's one thing after another, after another. It's like an avalanche. Three big businesses from the top list in the country. Rolf, and by the way, Rolf wasn't even a privatized thing. It was automobile dealer created from scratch. It didn't buy anything. It didn't privatize anything. Same thing with Kiwi Bank. The guys created their own payment system, payment platform that was used by 15 million people and businesses. So they're destroying the market products on the in the Russian economy and these ferrous materials of that Chelyabinsk factory they were exporting a lot of these and one of the questions um, one of the accusations at them thrown at them is that they were exporting that to other factories to other countries that enabled other countries to produce military grade uh, transport and uh, articles so which is not wrong perhaps they were because this is what exactly these materials are used for but it indicates that there'll be no free economy in russia and the only reason for anybody to grow there will be to get funded by government and we also know that these money are not only depleting and running out but they're also not bringing anything good for economy because after having sown billions on the chemisov field uh, in hopes to get some russian private jet nothing grew on that field and all these Superjet and MS-21 and 214, all that is being delayed to who the fuck knows when. And Chemezov himself also acknowledged that nothing works. The engine PD-8 is not functioning properly. And the plane, because of using of Russian materials, became six tons heavier and can fly only at significantly shorter range. You know that whole story. Right. I w it was delightful for me to hear because they were saying that we built everything from our own materials, right? It's just heavy and doesn't fly now. It sounds like a joke. Fantastic plan. Right, and I want to recommend our viewers, I did that about a year and a half ago, an explanation why alternative imports do not work in Russia, while homemade doesn't work in Russia. Because in modern world, a uh, competitive product can be created only by means of cooperation. Boeing uses Product, product products uh, manufactured by dozens of countries. You cannot find, uh, you, it's very hard to find something where you produce everything for some pro a final product at home. We're not in the 14th century. And again, another moment is that the country where bureaucracy and FSB are ruling everything and everybody is being thrown to jail if they express different opinion, no creative people want to work in that country. There are no stimulus to do anything better. Because the moment you succeed, FSB will come, take it away from you and probably throw you in jail as well. And the only stimulus is to eat budgetary money and to ask for more. And that's exactly what Chemezov is doing, one of these Putin's oligarchs. That's a very curious story how he created that Rostec about 20 years ago now. And it's Soviet classics. He always comes to the government and says, we're that close to completing the product but if you give me just a little more money we'll definitely finish it and it'll be a fantastic product and then he gets that money and then the result as they say is on the face 
And this is classics of Soviet economy. Just, yeah, watch that video from a year and a half ago. And it doesn't work and will not work. So all these Putin's statements, tales of the crypt about 2030, we discussed that, right? Thank you so much, Vladimir. I think that's about it. Or do we have anything else? Um, no, I think we're good. I wanted to mention oil sector. Oil is stuck at 80 and some change. It goes slightly back and forth, but all the Putin's government hopes that suddenly it will go up and will bring them more money. It, they don't realize. So what we're seeing here is a slowly winding down series. I also heard some uh, saw some publications that Russian oil fleet got some issues. The gray tanker fleet is starting to be affected. Perhaps by next time you can aggregate some data on this. How much is it a one-time story? Or indeed, they, they, we are trying to solve that issue and trying to deprive Russian budget of a lot of uh, sources of income. Yeah, we can discuss that. Greek owners of uh, these vessels started to refuse from working with Russia just because of the pressure and sanctions. I'll tell about that. But the general concept is there is not no miracle in the making. There is no suddenly expensive oil that will bring a lot of money for Putin. So overall, his future is rather gray. Uh, unfortunately, it still lasts. Well, thank you so much, Vladimir. Until next time. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.